for inviting me to come and speak. I, I love to talk about the Canadian Fraud Centre, mass marketing fraud, and what we as consumers and businesses can do to recognize it, report it, and reject it, which is really our slogan. So um, if you do have any questions as I'm going, if I'm talking too fast, just go like this to me. I'm a fast talker. My, uh, my brain works faster than I speak, so and I'm trying to get as much information out to you as possible. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre is. So uh, it began in 1993, known as Phone Busters. And it was uh, it started up by the OPP when an um, officer recognized that there was a need to collect complaints, not just in one city, but in cities across Ontario, which then grew on a national level. In 2004, the RCMP took it over, and we are now an RCMP-led joint operations with the OPP and the Competition Bureau of Canada. We're a central repository for mass marketing fraud. So essentially, we collect information on various types of frauds. I'm going to go through a couple of them here today. We, we take over 30 different pitch types currently. Back when I started in 1998, we had three. So we've really seen scams evolve and grow over the last 18, 19 years, especially since I've been there. So there's, there's three key areas within the center. So we have the call center and intake unit, and I'm currently, this is the, the unit that I'm just managing temporarily as we wait for a corporal to come in. Um, so this is where the, the complaints come in. We speak with consumers, victims of fraud, attempted victims of fraud. We take down their complaint. We offer information if they're an identity theft victim. We make sure that they're contacting the credit bureaus. If they've uh, dealt with a financial transaction through a bank, we give them the contacts of where they can go to, to follow up to make sure that they're protecting themselves against further fraud. We also will validate our online complaints. So we have an online component as well, with, with this, uh, known as our fraud reporting uh, system. And uh, so we're inundated right now with calls and online complaints. So before we can really use the information that's reported online, we need a specialist to go through to make sure that all the information is being captured correctly so that when we forward that off to investigators, they can get a clear snapshot of what the scam is and what it entails. We currently have approximately uh, 14 to 15 full-time call takers, and that includes two team leaders. And they will um, input mail, they will do follow-up callbacks if needed, um, and our phone rings all day long. If, if anyone or if you know of anyone that's tried to call us, it, sometimes it can be very difficult. Our senior support unit is, is um, coordinated through an, our, one of our OPP staff, and she has about 50 plus senior volunteers that come in and offer peer support to senior victims of fraud. So what we noticed back in the early days was that senior victims were calling us back and advising that they were re-victimized. So we put into play back that was known as senior busters to coincide with phone busters. And what they do is they will come in on a weekly, um, bi-monthly, uh, for a couple of hours a week. And they have their, their, their clients that they call and they establish a rapport. They remind them if you get a call about a lottery and they ask you for money, you don't need to send it. They will uh, put together information packages to send out to them because we see many, many repeats of the same scam. So, and and with, with the senior population, it's always best when they have something concrete. Here's a magnet, put it on your fridge. Here's a notepad, put it by your phone. They, we really don't run efficiently without our senior volunteers. We also encompass about 10 to 12 student volunteers at any point in time, and that's uh, often done through the high schools, the college, and the university within North Bay. And lastly, the operational support unit. So that's the unit I normally work out of, and we take all of the information that's collected at the center, we will break down information packages and then liaison with law enforcement, financial institutions, our partners, who we may call us up and say, do you have every, uh, give us all your complaints on ABC company or this phone number, or we have this guy picking up money at a Western Union in downtown Montreal. Can you give us everything that you have on him? So being the center uh, where we collect the mass marketing fraud complaints, we're able to pull and, and advise them, well, you know what, it's not just Montreal where this guy's picking up money. Um, this same company, they have people picking it up in Edmonton or in Charlottetown. And it's all across the country. And the beauty part is that everything is central sourced within the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. 
So what is mass marketing fraud? Fraud on mass, it's committed over any type of communication, mail, phone, internet, email. We're seeing text messaging now being included there. It's mainly run by organized crime. This is not your mom and pop just running a, a scam into their basement. It's organized. They're hidden. They use technology to their advantage with the sole intention to steal money from consumers and businesses. And what can we do about it? Like I said, we need to recognize it so that we can reject it and then report it. So The intention there is to deceive, so there, there's a deception when, when we look at mass marketing fraud. So like I said, now we take pro we're probably over 30 different mass marketing fraud schemes that we can take, and they can vary. They're, they're not uh, clear cut all the time. We see different variations. I, I spoke with a gentleman, actually a, a, a victim in North Bay earlier this week, who was a victim of a romance scam, sent $3,000. He was initially calling me to tell me that a lawyer had been contacting him about an inheritance. And through the course of our conversation, he tells me, well, it's for my girlfriend. I said, oh, okay, well, I should put her name on file because if she's the potential victim. Now, meanwhile, he hasn't told me that he's lost money to the romance scam. He's calling me about this inheritance and this lawyer that is emailing him. So I said, what's your girlfriend's name? He goes, well, her first name's Nikki, but I don't know her last name. I said, okay, how long have you and Nikki been boyfriend, girlfriend? Over a year. I said, okay, where does Nikki live? Nigeria. Okay. So, in, and then in that backstory, so what we find out is that Nikki, his girlfriend, and I'm going to touch on romance scams shortly, met online, established a relationship. She wanted to come over and, and visit him. He paid $3,000 and she had some sort of emergency that she could not show up. I'm, I'm sure he sent other money, I can only assume, but he was only willing to tell me about the $3,000 and he didn't have any details because it had been over a year that he had sent it. So now, Nikki was entitled to this inheritance through an uncle, where there, and she wanted to share it with him of $65 million. But now, he needed to send the lawyer, I believe it was anywhere between four and $500. So it, in, in essence, we had to convince, or I had to convince him that, and I think he recognized that fairly quickly. I said, you know, we have no guarantee that Nikki's even a woman. I said, you need to realize that it's a syndicate. And that's, that's the reality, is that it's a syndicate over there, they, they target specific profiles, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but at the end of the conversation, this guy said, do me a favor, I said, and, and don't reply anymore. I said, because these individuals are going to come at you with every excuse because you've sent money once, and they'll continue to do so. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on some of the schemes listed here. We don't have time to go through them all. But when we look at 2016, we received over 77,000 complaints. Now these are validated, so these are complaints received over the phone or online that we've actually gone through and validated, and the total reported dollar loss is over 99 million. So if we look at the top 10, so now these are based on complaints. I'm gonna show a second slide shortly of, of a different top 10 list. So when we look at 2016 extortion, so that's the, the CRA scam, and to our neighbors to the south, uh, it's the IRS where they're calling, and, and so, I'm going to get into that in just a second. So we look at the volume there. So we received close to 30,000 complaints, but our dollar loss is 4.6. I want you to keep those figures in your mind when I get eventually get to the, to the next slide uh, of the top 10 scams. So just to touch on extortion, there's two types of extortion scams that we primarily receive. The hot one right now involves the CRA. So a scammer's calling. There, it's often a, a recorded message, or it's a message that's left on your phone. They're claiming that it's the CRA, you owe back taxes, you're being investigated for tax fraud. They'll often say it's the CRA investigative unit. They'll use a, a claim to be an officer, they'll use a number of different titles to entice fear, make the message, it's very, very threatening. We ha often have, a, especially our senior population, call and say how frightened they were, how it caused them great anxiety and stress that they received this, this call, claiming that they could be charged, arrested, and in many cases, deported. For new Canadians that are receiving this call, they, ha they are, may not be aware who the CRA are, how they operate, and they've just fled a war-torn country, so there's a lot of fear instilled there. 
And what they, they what they're asking is, so they're claiming, uh, you know, the money's owed for back taxes. Go out and, and get us ten hundred dollar iTunes cards or Steam cards and send us the numbers, and that will clear everything up. <laughs> Crazy, right? They do it every single day. We receive calls that consumers have sent these guys these numbers and or cash. They take these these numbers and then they sell them. So they'll sell a hundred dollar gift card for eighty dollars. We're assuming that's what, what they're doing with it. Every single day, consumers lose money to this. And I don't know if you've noticed, um, and, and maybe I'm, I'm hoping that, that it's here, but back home, our local pharmacies and convenience stores actually have a notice above the prepaid gift cards. The CRA will not ask you to send a prepaid gift card, which is fantastic. So and if, if, if you see that, great, and I tell them, I said, that's great that you have that sign there. And, and you know, if you get anyone that, that you suspect, you know, tell them to call us. Because that's really where, where it's got to stop, is at that level. So the same top 10 list, but now let's look at dollar loss. So you'll see a significant difference. So romance scams complaints, we're just looking at, at over at 1,267, but our dollar losses are over 20 million. So while our number of complaints, and again, complaints can be a victim or an attempt, we see the number of victims there, but the dollar loss is huge. Romance scams continue to plague Canadians, and I'm, I'm guessing Americans, I'm guessing around the world. It's a very successful scam. They prey on people that are online that may be lonely. They prey on people that are newly divorced, newly widowed. They will always have something in common. They really profile. They will look at a profile and then profile themselves to fit the needs of that individual. You know, they belong to a bridge club. That's so funny, so do I. There's always a common denominator. The majority of our victims, I would say close to 80% are women, but there are men, as, as you, I spoke earlier, a gentleman in North Bay. So why do they work? Um, I'm just gonna show a, a quick video. This was done, uh, it's called Crime Without Blood, if you're ever on YouTube. This is just the, the two minute intro into it, but it's actually, they're interviewing it, it's from the Netherlands, and they actually go on and in, interview consumers that have lost money to the love scam, the dating scam, romance scam often known as catfish, according to Dr. Phil, um, which I love that he promotes it. I love that he, you know, you got to get the information out there. But and anyone that's ever seen one of his episodes, how hard it is that he cannot convince people that these are, are, are scams. So it's sometimes very difficult for us to be at the other end of a phone and convince someone that the love of their life is not real. <laughs>
So I like to show that because it, it, that's exactly how it happened. Is and, and con victims of romance scams will report to us and say, it was the highlight of my day getting that email, getting that text. It made me feel alive. And romance scams not only harm Canadians, Americans, worldwide consumers financially, but there's also an emotional component to it. And it can be very, very difficult to, to deal with those consumers to, and it, because in many cases they're, they're devastated on so many levels. So our call takers at the center, we really, really have honed in on how to take the time to show compassion that these consumers, you know, it's like, it's like baiting someone and setting them up. And there are, there are consumers that have lost their life savings believing that the love of their life is in a different country and they can't make it here. There was one gentleman in, in, northern, uh, in a northern city who in his 30s has told the Canadian Fraud Center that he's going to sue us because we're interfering with his love life. Because this woman is coming to his town to marry him. We had uniformed officers go over. We, and we'll, we will liaison with local police and say, listen, we've got this guy. He has a worker who's, who's called in. Can you go over and talk to him? Sometimes the uniform has a, has a lot of say, which is great. They went over. They called us back. They sat and talked with this guy. They said, this guy does not have any money to send to anybody. And he's sending every last cent he gets to this woman. So all we can do is encourage, we will follow up from time to time, but for every call, we, we, we know that, the, again, for that one victim, there's so many others out there that are not aware that they're being scammed. So we look at solicitation methods here. So the scammers still, their, their, their solicitation method of choice is still phone, but if we look at, if you see the, the orange red, they get the most victims online. So it's more profitable. So the the gray area that there, that's the, the attempted victims. Those in red, those are actual reported victims. And that's primarily due, we see a high number because of the romance scam. If we look across the country, it's generally based on a population. So your, your higher populated provinces and territories are going to have the most reported complaints. And so uh, usually BC, it, it, Alberta, BC, this is the first year that Alberta's kind of beat out BC in that regard. So we'll need to do some further analysis to try and figure out was there a particular scam that was targeting Albertans this year. So in that, it's great to capture that so that we know what's happening across the country. So who's being scammed? <laughs> group, every demographic, there, there, it doesn't matter. There's a scam out there and the fraudsters will see an in and they will use that to target a particular age group, particular race even. We've seen that with different scams where all of a sudden the, the Polish community in the larger city centers um, were the target of the, the emergency or the grandparent scam. And the fraudsters would call and, and start speaking Polish. So that's the reality is that, is that no one is really immune to it. We estimate that less than 5% of mass marketing fraud is reported to us. So if you think back to those top 10 lists that I gave you earlier, that's less than 5% of what the actual big picture is. And, and we base that on, on reports and studies that have been done in the past. So why is it underreported? There's many factors. Primarily, consumers are embarrassed. They're embarrassed and they're ashamed that they've been duped, that they've sent money, that they've lost it, that people will judge them. Uh, they're worried that their family and friends, what they're, they're going to think of them. Um, they're, they're also afraid that, especially with our senior population, that their family or their children may take control of their finances if they find out what I've done. So they keep quiet about it. And sometimes we're dealing with a cognitive impairment. But primarily, consumers just want to move on. They want to forget that they did that. They want to forget that they won the Australian lottery. They sent $10,000. They didn't get it, but they don't want to tell anyone. 
what will they think? And our main message is the key to stopping this is to report it. It's very difficult to report these types of scams, but if we have all the information, they may have that one piece of the puzzle that an investigator needs to, to connect the dots and to bring people to justice. It has happened. Unfortunately, as you know, these slides indicate, it's, it's low. So when we look at the age range, um, the most reported complaints are coming from the 50 to 69 year olds. But again, if you look at, at the red and the orange, it's the 20 to 29 year olds are the most reported victims to us. And again, that's primarily due to the internet and a lot of text uh, scams. A lot of phishing is, is coming out on that. A lot of personal information is being provided and we're really seeing that with that demographic. How is money being sent? This kind of varies from year to year. Other includes cash, money orders. We see a lot of uh, money service businesses, so Western Union and MoneyGram, like loan scams that were targeting Americans. That was their um, um, currency of choice was to, not currency, but uh, mode of, of payment was through the money service businesses. So uh, you've been approved for a $20,000 loan, but they need a security deposit. Can you send $1,000 to your loan agent uh, via Western Union or MoneyGram? Now what we're seeing a lot is, is, of course, digital currencies like Bitcoin, which are very, very difficult to trace. The other there, that includes cash. Um, uh, other, it should be, I don't think it's, it's pulling up here. Yeah, it's not in, it, it's in there, but our percentage is low. It would be its own category under digital currency. We don't, we, we do get some, but it's not the volume that we get, uh, like what we see with credit card. Credit card being our number one in 2016. So some other cyber facilis, facilitated scams, and I'm going to touch on, on some of these. So this is um, currently what we're seeing. A lot of card not present fraud. So we have a, a partnership with the airlines. So there's a lot of airline tickets that are being purchased with credit cards that, that are not present at the time. And so we have a, a partnership and, and we work to ensure that the card holder is aware that their number's being used and to let the airline know that this is you know, possibly a fake ticket. Of course, romance scams, which I touched on. Merchandise scams, we see a lot of that with, with PayPal and uh, other, other uh, means where they're buying something on Kijiji or they're selling something on Kijiji and they receive a false payment by PayPal. Um, they send the goods off and then they find out that it was a fake email, that they've just spoofed the, the PayPal page. And so now they've, they don't get the payment and they've lost their merchandise. And we work closely with, with Canada Post to, to try and intercept those packages before they leave the country. So uh, if we look, go back to extortion scams, because again, it's one that, that's high on the radar and, and ransomware. I'm sure uh, people have heard in, in the news the, the WannaCry virus or malware and the uh, crypto locker that we had before. Um, this is an older slide, but this is one that was actually targeting consumers. So if you're on a gaming site or a pornography site and you clicked on something, it would bring up this pop-up. It looked like it was coming from CSIS. And it's got the RCMP logo there. Your computer's shut down. You need to pay $300 before we will unlock it. They've kind of gone bigger now. When um, you know schools and hospitals seem to be the target, now they're asking for $30,000 in bitcoins to be sent. It, it's we advise consumers and businesses when they report to us to not pay the ransom because you have no guarantee you're going to get anything back. But we have heard reports that some people did get some of their information back. We really promote that the, the key is to have a current backup. And that goes for home life, business, across the board, in your workplace. Ask about, is, is my information securely backed up? Uh, educating staff so that they know not to click on. If you receive an email and it looks fishy, don't start getting clicky with the mouse. You know, ask your tech person about it before you all of a sudden disable your entire system. Wire frauds, otherwise known as uh, like the CEO or business executive scam. So this is where your HR person or your accounts payable person gets an email. It looks like it's coming from the, the CEO. And they'll go as far, we, we've, we've heard reports where uh, let's say Tom, the CEO, uh, is big, he's a big Alouette fan, so he's got a little football underneath his signature. Well, the scammers will 
will mimic that so that when you look at this email quickly, oh, this is from Tom, he's got his little uh, Alouette football there. Uh, he's asking me to send a transfer, I'll just go ahead and do it, not realizing that there's two M's in Tom and not one. That money is sent and, and it's gone usually to an overseas bank account. And it's very, very difficult to get that back. Um, it's subtle, and just to go back to that, if you look, there's sometimes there's subtle clues. So here we see two, I'm not sure if it's showing up on the, the bigger the screen here, but there's actually two different color font um, styles there, two different. So there's, sometimes there's these subtle clues that there's something wrong with the email. It's just noticing them. Phishing, phishing continues. Uh, it used to be with the banks. Every, every bank, uh, Canadian bank, we received phishing reports on them. Why does it work? Because every one person out of two doesn't realize it's a phishing email. The, the current one that we're seeing is, it involves a traffic infraction. So they've got the government of Canada, they've got the flag, but again, subtle hint, 30 miles per hour. And they're even going as far as in including a photo of here's where you're parked. And there's a couple of photos out there. This is probably one of the most common ones that we've seen. They'll also try to entice you. Here, uh, a ticket's been purchased, and you open it up and go, well, I didn't purchase a ticket. Well, I'll click on this link if there's, any, if there's any problems. Well, that's a malicious link. So you're potentially downloading uh, disabling hardware or uh, software on your computer. So. In partnership with the Competition Bureau and the OPP, we do a lot to promote the various types of frauds. There's a number of videos out there. If you search on, on any of the websites, the Competition Bureau has a little black book of scams. They have those videos on their, their site. You can order uh, a physical copy of the book, even to have one in your office. It is a great little book, and it's really well done. The cartoons are cute, and it's very simply laid out, and it's available in both English and French. Our website has a list of all different fraud types. Uh, we post fraud bulletins, we do two a month. And if there's a variation to a scam, we, we saw the variation now with the traffic infringement where they were adding the photo. So we'll very quickly, we'll, we'll update those alerts so that consumers have the most up-to-date information. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Please follow us, please promote that. There's information that we, we try to post daily. March is always Fraud Prevention Month or Fraud Awareness Month, depending where you are. And, and we try to be very present on social media. Again, we're a small office, so there are days where we're, we're, we're not uh, you know, as on the ball, but we do try to get as much information out as possible. We also try to um, develop fraud awareness aimed at reducing fraud. So we have an email address, partners at antifraudcenter.ca. If you'd like to be on this distribution list, we will send you our fraud bulletins as soon as they are approved for publishing. So you'll get an electronic copy. If we come across news articles, we will um, send those links out to our law enforcement partners and to people on this distribution list. So it's kind of up-to-date information that even if you had one person designated in your office, hey, why don't you sign up for this and get that information. We welcome it. If you have someone that needs to report um, law enforcement, if you're not law enforcement, don't email that address because it'll be archived. It's for law enforcement only, so they can send their reports of mass marketing fraud so we can upload them into the database. We have our toll-free line, our fax, and of course our online reporting system, our FRS, which you can easily get to from our website. When in doubt, when a telemarketer called and asked to speak to the person that runs the house, handed the phone to my three-year-old and went back to watching Paw Patrol. In our house, that's this guy. And I can solemnly swear he's up to no good. And he loves Paw Patrol. Um, I thank you for uh, allowing me to come and speak. I know it's a lot of information. I could talk for probably three more hours if I had, but um, I welcome any questions or comments, and I'm available even afterwards as well.